The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose rains fall upon the just and the unjust, hear our prayer. You set your rainbow in the clouds as a sign of the covenant you made with all Earth's creatures. Unlike yours, our memory fades. Though we too have a sign by which to remember, the empty tomb, we often forget whose we are. But now in gathering here, we remember well. Look upon us, come upon us, O God. Send your promise by your Holy Spirit. May it descend upon us like a dove. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as you are able. the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered them, or him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. This morning, my spouse overheard me rehearsing the message that I've prepared for you today, and she said in her off, her usual offhand way, uh, you'll want to remember to wear a tie and a coat if you're preaching in chapel today. So I walked out the door, absentmindedly as usual, and here I am. <laughs> Nevertheless, grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in a happy convergence of sermon and text, last night I finished the book Faithful, a diary kept by two Red Sox fans during last year's championship run. So Provost Kimball's chapel message yesterday was timed just right. Anyway, what impressed me about the book, and I promise this will be the last sports illusion I'll make this year, what impressed me about the book is how the theme of belief is sustained throughout. It seems to me that for the book's two co-writers, belief is an excruciating exercise in stubborn loyalty, in stubborn loyalty and creative hope. Belief is something that is asserted, asserted despite decades of heart-crushing disappointment and despite the fact 
that the future doesn't look very promising either. In other words, in the book, belief is something that is done despite all evidence to the contrary. Turning to the gospel reading then, we find that the disciple Thomas can't hold a candle to the Red Sox faithful. In fact, Thomas, unlike the Red Sox faithful, has evidence to consider. He has the eyewitness testimony of the other followers, the ones to whom Jesus had already appeared. But their word was not good enough. Now, I've put a, um, a, more close, a closer translation of the key passages or the key verses in the text right there for you uh, in the order of service. So when we get to that point, you can look at them and you can kind of follow my reading of the passage. You have perhaps heard the sermon about Thomas getting a bad rap. Perhaps you heard just such a sermon this past Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, on which we always highlight the story of Thomas. So you perhaps have heard a story about how, or a sermon about how Thomas has gone down in history as doubting Thomas, lamenting this fact, and about how it's such a shame, and about how Thomas doesn't deserve to have such a snippy nickname, and about how it really wasn't his fault, he wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the other disciples, and about how doubt is a necessary part of faith, and blah, blah, blah. With all due respect to the one from whom you heard such a sermon, of course, Thomas is no doubter, if we look close. He is no doubter. Let's get that straight right now. Thomas is not waffling between two opinions stuck somewhere in the no man's land between yes, it's true, and no, it's not. The word doubt, as you know, has the same root as the word double, as in two, as in on the, on, on the one hand, on the other hand. That's doubt. That's doubting. And that's not Thomas. Let's admit it. What we have here is an unbeliever, plain and simple. When Thomas heard his disciples report their encounter with the resurrected Jesus, he simply did not believe them. More than that, for belief to happen, for his belief to happen, Thomas set up strict parameters, very strict parameters, laboratory conditions, if you will, within which Jesus, rumored to have risen, would have to present himself. Unless I see the mark in the nails in his hand, said Thomas, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. What we have here is classic scientific method, right? Observation. I haven't seen Jesus since they killed him. Hypothesis. Jesus is still dead. Prediction. Reports of his being alive again might be attributable to mass hallucination or, mass hallucination or ghosts. Experiment or demonstration. <clears throat> if Jesus is not dead but risen, then I should be able to put a finger in the holes made by the nails and a hand in the slice made by the soldier's spear. Conclusion, ratify or modify the hypothesis based on the results of the experiment. That's how the scientific, scientific method works, and this is what Thomas has in place to believe. Thomas's encounter with the risen Christ is one of those be careful what you wish for stories, of course. A week after Easter, Jesus shows up. Although the doors are locked, we're told, he calms everyone down with a peace be with you, and then he goes straight after Thomas. John's report of the scene is compact, as if Jesus, uh, as if Jesus entered, went straight for Thomas and said, here I am, have at me. At this point, some translations say that Jesus said to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. But you will note that in the original language, Jesus does not use the word for doubting, but the word apistos, unbelieving. I love how Caravaggio imagined the scene in the famous painting, and you'll see that on the back, a rather gruesome depiction from about four centuries ago. As a couple of other disciples look on, as you're looking at this picture, you see that Christ holds aside the top of his robe with the one hand, and with the other hand, he is guiding the hand of Thomas and splaying open the wound with that finger, Thomas peers in, carefully investigating the physical clues. Now, it may be that some of you, when hearing this story, might experience a bit of Thomas envy, wishing that you could subject the claim of Christ's resurrection to such scrutiny, to a similar demand for empirical evidence. Like Thomas, you would like to get your hands on the body of the crucified one, now risen or said to be, 
For you, after all, that bit of bread they hand out every week and the words, this is my body, isn't good enough either. After all, in your world of demonstrable fact, bread is bread, or under some circumstances, toast. With you, as with Thomas, for something or someone to be really real, much less really present, it has to be observable, tangible, measurable. Judging from what Jesus says to Thomas in the end, I think we can say that Christ is sympathetic to the limits imposed by your rational mind. Have you believed because you've seen his rhetorical question asked of Thomas? And then Jesus says, blessed are those, blessed are those, although they did not see, believe. Those of you who count yourselves among those who believe without benefit of the hands-on experience enjoyed by Thomas, please do not pat yourselves on the back just yet. Because when Jesus says, blessed are you, what he means is, you have been blessed. You are blessed. You have received a blessing. In this case, it is the blessing of believing without saying, seeing in the way that Thomas saw, or without hearing in the way that Thomas heard, or without touching in the way that Thomas touched. Christ does not say, good for you for believing without seeing. Christ does not say, hey, way to go, those of you who, unlike this poor sap Thomas, have managed to muster up enough belief despite the lack of evidence, self-congratulations all around? No. Instead, the Lord says, blessed are you. That is, you have been granted a blessing, namely, to believe. And to believe without benefit of sticking your digits in the puncture wounds made by the nails or in the flappy, uh, fleshy flap there made by the spear, probably a good thing for the squeamish among us. Listen. What you have in this resurrection story is not an occasion to feel superior because you are more credulous than Thomas or to compare your ability to suspend disbelief with that of your evidence-addicted neighbor. Instead, what you have here in this story of Thomas is an illustration of the scripture verse that says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, but it is the gift of God. What you have, in other words, is a risen Lord who, with a word, opens unseeing eyes, even yours. Amen. Thanks, Hans, and congratulations on the defense of your dissertation just this week. Let us pray. Well, God, as we turn from doubt, our doubts, the doubt of our society, to the certainty of your resurrection. We come asking for a deeper faith, for hearts tuned to the ways of peace, for bodies in hands to bind the wounds of the weak. This day we lift to you, people in our community that we are thinking about that need those hands and bodies, We think of the world as they mourn the loss of the Pope, and we ask for direction in that leadership of the Catholic Church and the Christian Church as decisions are soon to be made. We ask for lives that would be turned to loving, for in the evidence of your hands and feet, doubt is transformed in the glory of Easter. And we pray this in your triumphant name. Amen. Let us stand and continue singing the same hymn about Thomas.
I'm sure most of you had uh, a real easy time with that. It's, <laughs> but uh, it's a wonderful hymn, and it's probably the only one in the uh, hymn book that directly refers to Thomas. So if, even though we had a little tough time singing that, uh, dwell on the words maybe for the rest of the day. A little bit of unusual circumstance in that we have our all-hands convocation fit into our regular schedule, so there is not an, on the convocation schedule, which means that the president, President Frame, will give us the State of the Union, so to speak, along with some of the other vice presidents. We will have a worship service to begin the convocation, and we are going to start actually a few minutes early, so we're going to start at 10.15, so you can keep that in mind. Receive the benediction. May the God who shakes heaven and earth, whom death could not contain, bless you with power to go forth and proclaim the gospel. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.